Good afternoon and welcome everyone to this webinar, Costs and Benefits of Data Provision. Um, in the room with me, um, looking at the slide, there's uh, Professor uh, John Houghton to my left and here's uh, Adrian Burton, who's the Director of Services and probably just off camera, Susanna Sabine. We also need to acknowledge Nicholas Gruen, who's a co-author of the report, co-author I should say, but who's not here today. So I will hand over to Adrian to describe um, very briefly what ANS does and why we're interested in this. So, Dr. Burton. Costs and benefits of data provision. Why would ANS be interested in such a thing? Um, well, ANS, uh, Australian National Data Service, for any newcomers to the uh, webinar today, is uh, an infrastructure program within Australia that, uh, in fact, its overall goal is for there to be more valuable research data for researchers. Um, so really that is uh, in fact our core mission, that um, we want research data, the, the outputs of research and the inputs of research that are um, data products, uh, for them to be more valuable for um, researchers in Australia. And of course, not just for researchers, but for uh, education, industry, public policy, general citizens in Australia to have access to that data. Um, our focus, of course, is to make better research. So we're, we're really framing our questions about the, the uh, value of data you know, within its value to um, have better research. Uh, quite often, if we go back a little bit, um, perhaps because of the um, information revolution and other sharing practices, it has become more possible to you know, share data, reuse data, and have it as a valuable output of, of research. Perhaps if we wind back a bit, the general um, attitude towards data was that it's a, you know, a waste product or a byproduct of, any, of the research industry, you know, like carbon dioxide or uh, other, you know, just pollutants that just spill onto the floor. And once you've done the project, then it's just one of the things you throw away. It's a waste, uh, a, a byproduct, if you like. But now with the you know, sharing systems and you know, the fact that a lot of the data is digital and there's an absolute amazing global network of information sharing, uh, the data itself is, is now being recognized as a, uh, a valuable product. Not a, you know, so what is the difference between a, you know, a byproduct and, a, and a, a major product? It's where you see the value. And in one sense, perhaps what we're doing now is reconfiguring our research uh, systems to take into account this uh, product of research and say, well, what is its value and how can we make it more valuable uh, again for you know, better research and for the broader society? So that's why we are interested because actually it's the, it's the actually behind what, the whole idea behind the Australian National Data Service, everything we do around uh, research data management, infrastructure, policy, um, citation of data, everything is uh, so that the, that output of research and the input to research is more valuable. So it was in that kind of a context, if you like, that we've worked previously with John and uh, we thought, well, okay, what about that question? How would we, how do you measure uh, the potential for uh, value in data? Okay, so there are actually two reports, and the first report will, will deal with that first up. And the second report um, is written by um, John Houghton and Nicholas Gruen. And I did not mention that Nicholas Gruen was also the author of the Gov2 Task Force report, and he is from Lateral Economic. So, John, I know you just can't wait to get stuck into this. Could you take us through that first report? Yes, sure. I think it was around 2011 that we actually did the study focusing on government information, public sector information, PSI. And we did case studies of the Australian Bureau of Statistics, um, Geosciences Australia, and um, hydrological data um, using with both the National Water Commission and the Bureau of Meteorology. It was an interesting, it was, I think it's unique. I've never seen another study that actually does a measures the costs and the impacts before and after. It was a unique opportunity because the ABS in particular had just adopted 
open access and then a year later CC licensing. So it was, it's, it, most studies try to estimate the future benefit of open access, but this was actually a study in which we had the before and after. So it was, uh, it was a really good opportunity. Having said that, uh, I probably don't have to say that measuring these sorts of things isn't easy. And we, there were limitations to the data that we had available to do the study. So in a way, it was really only the Bureau of Statistics case that worked well. The other two were much more limited. We used sort of three elements to it. We looked at the um, activity costs and cost savings of the agency, um, focusing on the ABS, since that's the one that worked best. And we looked at what sort of new activities were being done and what activities weren't being done any longer as they adopted open access. For example, the ABS used to have um, quite a lot of shop fronts uh, where you could go in and buy uh, reports and so on. And they greatly reduced the number of shop fronts. So the, you know, they, these kind of savings were available for, for agencies like that. We, we focused on the agencies and we didn't do a survey of users, but so there was an assumption in that um, we, we, we assumed that the user costs, activity costs, were kind of the mirror image of the agency activity costs. For example, one of the activities that the ABS and the other agencies were doing was answering the phone and answering queries about licensing conditions, what they could and couldn't do with the data. Now, obviously, there's two people on a phone call, so the assumption that the amount that it cost ABS to run that service was also being spent by the user on the other end of the phone. So it, we made that assumption. It was a sort of a simplifying way to do the study. In the case of the ABS, um, we, we basically found that they ended up losing revenue, of course, from not uh, selling data, but they also made some savings um, that we could quantify and they had quantified. Um, they also, there were also savings in a sense that we didn't quantify, which was in things like uh, if you stop doing the shop front, then everybody in the organisation can concentrate on the real issue of gathering and, and producing statistics. So it's, it's like um, distracting activities that they had to manage, they could focus on core business a bit more. So there were savings there. On the other side, we, we also tried to look at the wider impacts and we used a, both a welfare approach um, and a, a return on investment in data uh, approach. Um, both of those require some measure of um, the impact of open access, basically um, the amount of extra use. Um, and that was where the study actually turned out to be much more difficult than I would have envisaged. Uh, what we tried to do was to use download website statistics, download data from each of the agencies um, from before and after. But of course, there's a whole range of reasons why downloads change, go up basically over time. There was a general trend in the mid late 2000s of people to download things more than they did the year before. I mean, it's still the case. So um, there was obviously, if you have more available online, there's going to be more downloads. So you have to look at both the extension and the intensification of use. And this proved to be actually extremely difficult. But um, we did manage to sort of tease out both the extension and intensification of use a little bit, enough to make some estimates. And I think. Basically, the bottom line for the ABS was that the overall costs for both the agencies and the users of doing it was about five million a year, circa 2006, 2007. And the total benefits, the savings plus the increased returns was about 25 million a year. So the benefits were about five times the costs in that case. Should we bring that graphic up? From yes, the, the, um, yes. That's, uh, John, before you go into this uh, gorgeous equation, could you explain that term welfare? Because it has other meanings, doesn't it? Uh, yes, it does, but uh, I think it probably means the same in economic terms, broadly speaking. 
it's a it's an approach that basically it, what we were trying to do was estimate the change in consumer surplus. So consumer surplus is the difference between what people would have been willing to pay and what they did pay. So if you don't have to pay as much as you were willing to, then you're getting a benefit of consumer surplus. And there's various producer consumer surplus add to social welfare. So obviously, if you stop selling something and give it away, then there's a lot of people who were paying for the data that don't have to. So that is a consumer surplus straight away. There's also the issue that more is going to be used more. Um, so there'll be more users who weren't willing to pay the old price, but they're willing to pay zero. So then you, there's a sort of a standard way of calculating the increase in consumer surplus, that is the welfare part of the calculation. Now, that was an economic explanation. It probably <laughs> didn't help at all. <laughs> I just loosely described it as new users. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes. Glad that was the one, the, the one and one version. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, that graphic there, does that, uh, that's the one that ends up being five to one, doesn't it, John? In the case of ABS, yes. yes. Um, in the case of the Geoscience Australia, it was much higher, I think around uh, 13 to one, but um, for the particular type of data that they were using. But I think it's really important point to note that that doesn't reflect on the agency that, you know, the agency that gets 13 times the benefit isn't better as an agency than the one that gets five times the benefit. It's due to the completely different sorts of data and types of uses of data. Geospatial data is highly valued. I mean, most people use GPS. I use GPS to get here as it happens. <laughs> so everybody knows that it's valuable data and highly used. So it's important to realise that it's cost and benefit relates to the data, not the performance of the agency. Who uses this kind of data, John? Uh, this, the, the first of the two studies was basically public sector. Who uses that data? Uh, everybody, really, um, in various ways. One of the, uh, well, in terms of national statistics, clearly anybody who does anything uh, to do with the economy or policy uses national statistics. Anybody who uh, is in government, in a, in a sort of a non-government lobbying organisation or in industry are, are big users of various sorts of statistics. Um, you also get very, uh, in case of water data, um, we looked at the Victorian example, and one of the big users was um, schools, education, um, because and that's common in a number of other studies that I've done with research data and with um, public sector information, that um, students react a lot more and a lot more engaged if the data is actually real. You know, it's, it's a, it's a depth, me depth measurement from a river that they know exists. It's not a textbook example, it's just purely hypothetical. And it really helps students engage even when they know it's real data, you know, much more than they do with abstract hypotheticals. So in this case here, the, the, the cost benefit, um, or benefit cost, I should say, ratio sort of varies from sort of five to 20. I think a previous study by ASL Tasman put geospatial data at over 20. Mm. So we know that data is being used by government, it's being used by research, input to research as well. Yeah. And We'll talk later on about business and industry. Um, but am I right, John, that Nicholas Gruen or you and Nicholas um, extrapolated this um, in another study instead of just the ABS to the whole of the government? We did. A, um, the, the, the first study that we're talking about here is, was case studies. So um, um, there was a wonderful Dilbert cartoon that I saw once that said, and Dilbert went into his box with a pointed hair and, and said, my PowerPoint has everything. I've got uh, data for the real people and case studies for the idiots. <laughs> <laughs> so I just bring that up. Because <laughs> I'm not really going with it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not we just lost half our audience. <laughs> <laughs> but um, you can't really, case studies are really interesting. I mean, they speak to uh, what's going on. A major point of doing the first report was to try to come up with a methodology that the departments and agencies could use themselves. 
to make the case for open access and to help them see the benefits to them of open access. But you know, you, any case study is just that. You can't multiply case studies and get the macro picture. So um, in a study that Nick and I did for the Amidia network uh, a year or so ago, we did a, a macro sort of estimate of the value of, of public sector information and research data combined. And we got an answer of around $17 billion a year. Uh, in in total currently. So the first study basically showed that the, the case for making public sector data freely available is sort of overwhelmingly positive. We have a figure, very, very a huge number here representing the annual value of that data. Well, I think I think um, I do I will mention that um, our statistics showed that that first study had um, I think in one year over 4,000 downloads all around the world. So I think you'll see government, state, territory governments and Commonwealth governments, all of the government departments have engaged to some extent in providing um, access to their data sets, freely available, licensed, and we'll talk a bit about licensing uh, towards the end. So, John, can we move you on now to the second report, the recent one, which is, I suppose, what most of the people are signed up for to find out about the open research data, the Houghton Gruen report. I'd like to take us through that one. It's a very different approach. It's not, it's not a case study approach. It's a, uh, uh, an, a, a sort of a macro approach. Um, there are two uh, main elements to it, and, and I'm, I'm hopefully going to state the really obvious. The first question was to try to measure the value of data in public research um, at the moment. And um, to state the obvious, that's something that exists so we could measure it. The second part of the study was to try to estimate the potential upside value of curating and sharing data from public funded research. Um, and that doesn't exist yet, so we had to estimate it. So um, the report is very much in two completely different sort of approaches. What we were trying to do um, was to um, measure, measure value and measure the potential upside value of curation. So the focus of the study was basically government funded research. And there's two ways you can look at that. That is funding by sector of funder. Um, Commonwealth government spending on research, which is about nine billion a year. But you can also look at it as a sort of a policy uh, level. Who's going to make the policy? Who's going to follow the policy? In which case, it probably makes more sense to look at um, sector of execution. So government um, as, a, as a research organisation, the Commonwealth, uh, CSIRO and so on, and higher education for which you can make public policy. So we looked at that as um, that, that research at that level, which is about 13 billion a year. So that gave us a kind of a, a range estimate of, of the sorts of things we were dealing with. Um, the first thing we did, we did two uh, approaches to measuring the value of data in public research. Now, um, I'm sort of carefully saying those words because what we can measure is people's use and the activity of using data. But of course, research is a global activity. Not all the data used by Australian researchers is Australian. Um, quite a lot of it isn't. Um, so we're not talking about the value of, of data produced in public research. We're talking about the value of the activity of using data in public research. I'm not sure whether I'm making that clear, but um, it is an important distinction. The first thing we did was a really simple approach. It's probably the most basic sort of costing approach you can use in economics, which is use value, which is simply measures the time um, and other costs involved in creating, manipulating, and analyzing data. Um, and the second approach we used was to try to look at a return on investment in the amount of money spent on the activity 
at average returns to R and D. For both of those, for the whole report, in fact, um, we based, we in a sense didn't do any original research. We based it on a series of studies that I've been doing and am doing uh, in the UK with Neil Beagree, Charles Beagree Limited. And we've been doing studies of research data centers. We did a study uh, first of the economic and social data service, um, one of the archaeology data service, uh, one of the British Atmospheric Data Center. And we're currently doing a survey at the moment um, for a study at the European Bioinformatics Institute. So based on, so what we're doing is to use the activities that we know about from the users of data centers in the UK and say that uh, if that was happening um, in Australia, what would that be worth? So basically we found that in the UK studies, the survey respondents, of which there were many thousands, by the way, um, reported that they, and their, in their opinion, others in their field, spent um, between 35 to about 60% of their research time creating, analyzing, manipulating data. 35, 30% if you're an archeologist, 60% if you're an atmospheric physicist. I mean, that's not surprising. So broadly, I mean, just as a simple mean, uh, we took about, said that about 45% of research time um, of typical researchers is across disciplines is uh, spent with data. So um, that's worth um, anywhere between two and six billion dollars a year in Australian public research. That was the first thing we did, the use value. The second thing was um, to look at uh, returns to R&D, and it's a, it's a complex sort of model to do that because the returns uh, accrue over 20 years and you express the value and net present value from one year's expenditure. But anyway, um, coincidentally, because it's a totally different me uh, method, the answer was the same. It was between two and six million, six billion, sorry, B, a year in net present value. So that was our estimate of the value of data. It's a very broad range um, because uh, there's two ways in which you can do it. And Nick and I, I think, spent two very long, fruitless evenings arguing to and fro which we should do. So we ended up doing both because we couldn't decide. <laughs> so that explains why there's a range. We also felt that, to be honest, you know, if we can't, if we gave a pinpoint number, like 5.9, A, we don't know how accurate it is really. And so a broad range, I think, is more honest. Um, but I would say that I'd expect the answer to actually be closer to the top end of that range, closer to the 6 billion than 2 billion. Um, that, that's kind of a, a, an opinion rather than a calculation. So what I've been talking about was the value of data, which is the left-hand column, and that's what it says, 1.9. I said 2 to 6 billion. But that, that describes what we were uh, using, research activity times in the UK, and the use value and the return on investment calculation. So now moving over to the other side with the repositories heading, and they are completely separate, as I say. One is existing, we measured it, and the other doesn't exist, so we estimated it. Um, moving over to that side, we tried to look, tried to estimate the potential upside value of repositories. So basically, the calculation is saying um, if all of the researchers publicly funded in Australia um, realize the same benefits as the regular users of the UK data centers, then this would be the potential upside value. Now, of course, it could be a lot more than that if we in Australia did better than the UK at managing and making data available. Uh, it could be quite a lot more. You know, you know there's no way to know. We're, it's just a way of getting a ballpark estimate. The two big things that um, all of the surveys in the UK that we've done, bearing in mind that the users of UK research data centres are not necessarily in the UK, 
Um, the things that they all report is the number one impact of using data centers is the efficiency impact, that they save a lot of time creating data um, and so forth. Um, and the second one is there's um, obviously additional use um, by uh, reuse, simply called reuse, um, by people who couldn't either create the data themselves or obtain it anywhere else. So that is pure additional new use, and we can calculate the value of that additional use. So the elements to this calculation were the times saved, and of course, when a researcher saves time, they don't think, okay, well, I'll finish at 3.30 and go home. They do more research. So the time saving is just the first step. The second step is, well, if you use that time to do more research, then that extra research is also going to have a return over time. So there's two elements there. Um, and the other one was the average return to the pure uh, new use. So, um, we estimated the sum of those impacts to be 1.8 to 5.5 billion a year. So the right-hand column, we uh, in, in, in essence have no idea how much of that is still available or already being done. But we, as a kind of a scenario estimate, we simply said that maybe 10 to 20% of the data we're producing is currently being curated and openly available, that's probably generous. Um, so unrealized 80 to 90%. So the unrealized upside, as we say, 1.4 to 4.9 billion a year is what's available um, to us. Um, there's a few issues, well, there's a lot of issues, obviously, around those things. We, we wanted to look at the value of national collections and um, there's obviously some specialist um, data centers around uh, in Australia. Um, we didn't do any kind of estimate, but I think it's fairly, I, I, it's just an opinion that given a pretty unique sort of uh, climate, uh, fauna, flora, and so forth, national data in Australia is probably worth more than national data about some things uh, is worth in a European country, uh, but that's just an opinion and we, we didn't sort of do an estimate of that. Um, the other thing we did, which we kind of isn't on this chart, we tried to think about, well, what would be the cost? We, we're saying the upside is maybe up to five billion. What's the cost? Um, and of course, we're measuring, we're trying to estimate something we haven't done yet, so you can't really cost it. Um, and it depends how you do it. Clearly, if you curate data very thoroughly, very well, it can cost you almost anything. It could be very expensive. If you do it badly, it doesn't cost you very much, but then you probably won't realize the five billion potential benefits. The one, the, probably the best, we, we went around a number of circles with it, but probably the best estimate, just as a ballpark again, was again to do with the UK research data centres, which have been historically, at least it's changing a bit now, but historically these sort of subject data centres were funded by the relevant research council. Mm. Um, so the uh, Economic Social Research Council funded the Economic Social Data Service and so on. There was a government report in the UK that said that across the disciplines, there, there was a remarkably consistent expenditure on those subject uh, repositories, data repositories, which was about 1.4 to 1.5 percent of total funding. So if we go back to our original what's public funding, nine to 13 billion, 1.4 to 1.5 percent would suggest 150 to 200 million a year would be the cost of sort of quality duration. So. Um, Clearly, 200 million as a cost and 5 billion as a potential benefit is pretty much in no brainer territory. It yeah. certainly is. Um, well, that's just really representing the, the uh, current estimate and the available upside of the 1.4 to 4.9. Um, 
the straight line is a straight line because it looks funny to just have two points. <laughs> but even an economist wouldn't say there was a trend between two data points. <laughs> I'm not sure why we drew the line there. Um, except that the graphic works. Um, yes, so that, that, that just sort of summarises what, what we think we're doing now and where we think we could get. But in that figure, there is there is more than just that, isn't there? Because in the top right hand corner, it's, I'm not sure if everyone can read that. It says all data using data infrastructure. Um, John, talk a bit, a little bit about data infrastructure versus repositories, because there is a bit of a difference. And we want to make sure people understand. You've mentioned the cost of running these centres is fairly small in relation to the possible return. So let's just get a discussion going on what. On the bottom left, you see an individual at a desk, and on the bottom right, we have full use of data infrastructure. What does that actually mean? What's the message there? Um, clearly, um, the infrastructure is both hard and soft. Um, certainly from the surveys we've done elsewhere, um, the, um, you know, the guidelines, the, the, um, the standards, and all these sorts of things are highly valued and highly important. It's certainly not about IT and networks. Um, obviously, that's essential. But the the soft infrastructure is is vital, and that mm -hmm. comes across very much from the studies we've done all the time. That um, you know people use the guidelines and go to a data center because of those kinds of facilities. I'm actually a pretty regular user of the Economic and Social Data Service in the UK because they have some wonderful, simple methodological guidelines available on their website freely, uh, which has nothing to do with the data as such. Um, so that's a really important, uh, very important aspect in terms of the infrastructure, if that's what you had in mind. It, it is. And there's two sides of there. We're talking infrastructure and policy. So what does the policy mean in this context? Yeah. Um, well, in the in the second report, we um, the, the made some policy sort of, um, what's the word? They certainly weren't recommendations, probably mumbling. Observations. <laughs> observations. <laughs> yes, okay, observations. <laughs> um, but so one of the points was the one we were just saying. It's both hard and soft infrastructure, and the soft infrastructure is very important. Um, a starting point, in a sense, policy point of view, is mandates um, from government, from funding agencies, from institutions. Um, and one thing that's come up in other studies, I recently did a study for the uh, Canadian Research Councils with a couple of people um, elsewhere, um, which was a, sort of a background to their recently announced tri-agency open access policy. But, um, one of the things that came up in that really strongly um, is the importance of harmonization of policies. Um, research is a global activity. You know, you, can, you don't just have one funder, one institution. You, you're collaborating across institutions, across countries, across funders. And if they all have different policies, mandates, different sort of... Uh, um, things that you have to do to comply, it's a nightmare. It, it, the cost of compliance is high and people just don't bother to do it unless they're really chased. So I think it's really important when we think about mandates to think about harmonising what we're expecting and asking worldwide as much as possible. I know that's a big <laughs> ask. I mean, that's, simple a, yeah, that's a simple thing to say to hands, you know, just go and do it. But, um, you know, it's something to bear in mind. Um, and that's all part of this going from, you know, uh, from the bottom star to the top star includes a coverage of all, uh, of, you know, the, all data that should be shared and, and reused, yeah. uh, being able to be. And yes. Part of that is the policy that promotes that. So. In, indeed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you've hit on another thing there in terms of, of uh, policy. Obviously, there's constraints about openness. Not everything can be open. There's privacy concerns. There's sort of, uh, you know, security, uh, commercial and confidence concerns. Not everything can be open. And it's, and it's vital to sort of sort that out uh, and make it really clear up front. Um, one trend, um, and I'm 
be careful not to criticise anybody. But one trend, um, and well, okay, I'll criticise my own university, Victoria University. When, and I think it's something we've got to think about in terms of policy, so I'm, forgive me if I'm drifting. When we want to do a survey, we get human research ethics uh, clearance application, and we specify what data we're going to collect, who we're going to ask, what we're going to do with it. Basically, we ask permission of the subjects to use the data for the purpose that we define. Now, that's fine if the data's mine and I'm going to use it, but if I'm going to make it open, I've got no idea what people are going to use it for in three years' time, so I can't possibly seek permission for that use. So I think most institutions have got to rethink the sort of research ethics process and that permissions process. It can't be about permissions. It's got to be about, um, you know, protecting the subjects or whatever it is from, you know, foreseeable harm. Um, confidentiality, privacy, those sorts of things. It cannot be about permission. Otherwise, it's never going to work. And, you know, I think I think that's something we need to rethink policy-wise. And that's another example of the harmonisation of these different, you know, ethics policy and or the ethics framework and the funding framework and yes. uh, other funders and, and uh, not making it hard for the researchers to have, you know, by having competing uh, requirements on them, you know, at the one hand to make things available, on the other hand to destroy them as soon as the project is finished. Or, yes, know. yes, exactly. Yeah. Yes, which is still, you know, the case with our ethics approval, you know, to keep it for five years, how are you going to destroy it is the question, not how are you going to make it openly available forever. But uh, so we, those things. We do so these are the things that are included in uh, when we say uh, by uh, through policy and infrastructure, you know, so a, a more coherent policy framework in the broadest possible sense of Absolutely. You know, ethics yeah. and commercialization and research funding policy uh, to bring us up to a, a broader coverage. Yes, yes. And um, speaking, and since Nicholas Gruen isn't here, I'll sort of speak on Nick's behalf. One of the things that he's very keen on policy wise is um, he runs an independent firm <laughs> so it's perhaps not surprising but um there's a trade-off in all of these things in policy between a, a kind of a top-down approach and a bottom-up approach um quite often there's a tendency um, to have a bit too much top down um so that, that you know that it, that presupposes that the person designing the top-down policy knows what's going to happen in three years' time and can predict how best to deal with it, which is often not the case, to be fair. Uh, whereas if you, um, you know, if you leave people to work out how to do it for themselves, you can get more innovative solutions. I mean, to, to give a... So I think that the mandates and the policies, in a sense, need to be about setting a vision, setting an aim. They need to be about guidelines. They don't need to be about instructions. Um, I think, uh, and, and perhaps as a concrete example, I might use my own university again and criticise it. Um, no, but you're reaching you know, a point close where... Close to retirement. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's easier to do, yeah. <laughs> Maybe closer than I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, um, Victoria University has an open access policy for publications, and... I sort of facetiously call it the fill a repository policy. It's not actually an open access policy. It, it defines the expectation of open access, but it says everything must be on the repository, the institutional repository. Well, that's, that's an instruction. The open access policy is a guideline, an expectation. I might, from you know, bottom up, might prefer to do it, indeed do, prefer to do it differently, use SSRN, REPEC, or what other you know, subject repositories, not institutional repositories. So I think in all of these things, when we're doing mandates, we should stop at the, the guidelines and the expectation and leave the implement, you know, uh, not all of the implementation, but how you actually achieve it for more, you know, um, innovation from the bottom up. A repository policy like that rather presupposes that green open access is going to be the solution, but I'm not 
sure that that's the case and um, don't think it is the case. So, you know, I think it's it's kind of foreclosing innovation that we could have and may actually be quite negative. And Nick's very big on that point. Could I ask John before we sort of formally ask our audience for questions, what's your current read on the policy for publicly funded data? I'm just dissolving the barrier between public sector data and research data. What's your read? Are the guidelines clear enough? Are they out there? You haven't mentioned licensing yet, but we might get to that because that's one of the things you need to do in order to allow people to use that. No point putting a repository if it's not licensed. So, yes, I'll jump into that question. IP. Um, look, um, I'm not sure I know. You, you two clearly know much more about it than I do in terms of those, um, those um, issues. Um, we have an interesting uh, questioner. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, my sense is the, the, there's quite a long way to go, both in terms of the guidelines and doing it. Mm. This is a question. Um, many researchers claim that there is no second use value for their research. Are they wrong for their data? Um, well, um, if people are using data from a data center that they could not have created and could not have obtained anywhere else, then they must be wrong. So someone is using it for something that they didn't foresee or collect it for. So uh, yes, I think they are wrong. Um, I think our ability as researchers to imagine what we can do with data is good, but it's not good enough to imagine what everybody else would think of doing with it. And I think, certainly think if you look at some of even the, the sort of the mashups that you get with public sector information, what people do with it is something you would never have foreseen um, in terms of apps and those sorts of things. And I think it's true of research data too. Perhaps whilst waiting for the next question, I could clarify, I might even ask Adrian to clarify, in order to get onto the top star, that to realise that five, five and a half billion, that is annually, it's not just enough to put your data in a repository. What else is required? What, what, what does that really mean, which reading that access increasing value of data as data access increases through policy and infrastructure? What else? What's something about well, you know, data you, licensing? The first thing to note is that you know, we're not at zero here. The, the bottom star is not at zero, zero. So uh, there is a... There is a Activity going on. You know, we have um, uh, infrastructure and some policy that is pushing us uh, at the moment. Um, for an example, the whole NCRIS program. Uh, obviously, not all of it is to do with um, managing and curating data. Some of it, some of that investment is to do with generating it. But as we all know, the way you generate, you know, does make a big difference to uh, reuse later. So anyway, if we take the, for example, the increase in investment of portion that is going into creating, you know, things like IMOS, et cetera, that, that uh, does have a, um, a management and curation and access and discovery um, role for marine data in Australia. So that's why, you know, we're obviously, you know, in, and particularly in, in those instances where we're, we're way, um, off being at zero, no. uh, so I think you know there's a um, part of the message here is uh, that those that where we have uh, data infrastructure, you know, that should be uh, continued and, and maintained. Um, ANS has been working across all the NCRIS facilities, but also with each of the research organisations, so that you know the organisations have a have a role in this, and you know there's been some great um, uh, uptake with you know, pretty much every research organisation in Australia. Um, what we need to you know, uh, go further there is um, making these things, so some of these things are the right thing to do, but you know, not always easy. So um, the tools and the support services and the promotion that, that makes it, um, makes managing, curating, publishing data, you know, as easy as it can be, is part of that infrastructure, uh, and that includes um, you know the kind of information that's required for reuse is a big.
question behind this is that you know some you know, I think behind Ross's question is well it may not be terribly useful for secondary use if you know we don't have the calibrations or the methodology or the uh, or it hasn't been collected using the community standard etc so those kind of things that you mentioned uh, are part of this you know making data you know more valuable and you know when we say it is valuable the, if we say that data in some kind of a data service is value valuable why is it well because it's so much easier to use you know because it's it's uh, uh, it's there it's been managed it's been documented uh, and so accessible so all those qualities are the ones that we're trying to bring into you know more as a business as usual for for, for data uh, a part of this again is the incentive question. So um, being able to track these reuses, reuse is an important part of the frame, if you like, that would sit around this that says that um, yes, there's an impact from the reuse of this data and that's somehow measurable and is a good reflection back on the original researchers, on the research organization and the data archive. All three of them, you need to have some way of getting a pat on the back to say that um, you know, we've had um, a, pl a part in this. And so that's where we're getting to these things about your know, data citation and uh, metrics for you know, use and reuse. Um, you know, they're an important part of this, this, this mix. Um, again, licensing, as you talked about. So yeah, they're, they're some about, of the ingredients. What about licensing, what could you say? Uh, well, particularly in the Australian um, context, uh, if, you're silent and assuming there is some intellectual property in the data that you've created if you're silent then silence means no consent to reuse in in the australian context so really you have to be i think everyone needs to be aware that if part of this whole new world is that we're assuming that the data is not a waste product but it actually is something that needs to be reused, then you need to say that. Somehow it needs to, those terms and conditions need to be made explicit that yes, this can be reused uh, in the most open way possible. So that's the idea of uh, putting a license. There's a very simple, you know, Creative Commons by framework, which uh, is a good place to start. Uh, you know, uh, why wouldn't you, know, you default there and say, are there any reasons not to use that as a starting point? And that means that there's clarity from your point of view, if there's any mistakes in the data, there's, you know, the indemnity is already baked in and there's clarity from the user's point of view. Yes, I can freely create new innovative products in research and industry and education that Absolutely. are not, not somehow clouded with uncertainty as to whether they can be reused. Look, we have some questions coming in, but we need to, I'd like to mention that we actually have a fully operational licensing system in this country called Osgold. So A-U-S-G-O-A-L, check it out. And it has a license checker. So this is the point that Adrian is making so well there. If you don't license the data, if you leave it unlicensed, effectively in law, um, no one can use it. All rights reserved. So let's go straight to the questions. I, well, I, re I really like the idea of recycling. It puts me in mind of you know waste product and recycling. It's mm. like being an organ donor. I, I sort of say you can use. I leave my data to science, you know, and it's, it's kind of a nice idea. Interesting yes. metaphor too. <laughs> yes. Well, and it's all part of the return on investment thing. You know, uh, industries, you know, let's say manufacturing industry, can make themselves more productive and more efficient by reusing some of the uh, what were previously called waste products. And same thing here in research. All right, we've got some questions. Should I just read them out so everyone knows what we're talking about here? Um, what is the optimum investment so that data is efficiently reusable? Uh, don't look at me. No. <laughs> <laughs> we are actually going to look at you. Well, I don't know. I mean, um, it's one of those things that I, we don't know. I mean, we don't actually know what's the optimum investment in research. Um, even though we have tables of performance that say that we invest a lower proportion of GDP than Finland does, it's actually a very controversial point. What is too much? Um, um, maybe there is a point at which it's too much. Um, I've only ever seen one study that tried to um, do that calculation. So, I mean, what's the optimum investment? I don't, I don't think we've got any idea, but I think it's probably more than we're currently doing. 
Mm. Almost certainly. Could. That question could be looked at another way, which is going back to an earlier point you made, the investment in, in data infrastructure over divided by the value of that data is a small number. Next question. Uh, what quality initiatives are planned to reward researchers for good data management and help others identify quality data available for reuse? What quality initiatives are planned to reward researchers for good data management? It's certainly one thing, I'm not answering the question, but it's it's one thing that comes out very strongly from the UK data centre studies, that one of the qualitative uh, sort of questions and answers that we're getting is that, that knowing the source and understanding the quality and the processing of the data that's there is what they value, what the users value. Uh, pretty much above everything else. So um, those two questions perhaps relate to each other, the optimum investment and the quality. Mm. Uh, so a quality initiative, I'm not aware of anything formal in that area. So a quality initiative, what I'm imagining you're talking about here is, you know, this is five-star data because, um, you know, it's accessible, easily uh, reusable, well-documented, openly licensed, you know, so... There might be some kind of a, st a standard around, you know, the quality of, of uh, good data. And as you say, if your data had that five, those five stars, then you know that would be a reward for that good data management, and would allow other people to um, recognise that. Now there are some very formal, at the very most formal level in Australia, the ABS does have a very rigid, uh, rigid, rigorous. <laughs> Got the first three letters right. A very rigorous framework for data quality, particularly if those that data is going to be used in a public policy uh, decision by COAG or something like that. Then there is a quite a, uh, a, a formal documentation of data quality uh, that is available on our data site on our website as well as on the ABS website. Uh, that's probably at one end of a spectrum of of very formal quality. Um, Quality assurance. Um, it's probably something we could do at the more informal research uh, collaboration level. Yeah. I'm just wondering, um, do either of you want to comment on what might be the answer to that question? Um, if uh, if it were the case that research funders um, counted data as research outputs rather than byproducts, which my understanding is currently. Australian funders do not do that. Uh, yes, and that's where <laughs> be a bit facetious. Uh, doing some kind of a mandate at that end may increase the quantity of <laughs> data, but not necessarily good quality uh, data. So uh, it's a good, you know, in, the, in your point about guidelines and, and objectives at that funding level, uh, it might be good to have a five star system that says. These are the kind of things that you know, are included in a good quality built research. On, built on the process that went yeah. into creating the data. Uh, we've got two questions. Uh, working on the new Osgold license, choose a now, and it will include questions about sensitive data and research data generally. I think we can take, say that, comment. take that as a, as a comment and good. say that that's Baden from uh, Osgold is working on that. And our final question for the day, what investment needs to be made in the education aspect of open data in the research sector? Is there any specific amount currently invested on education or should there be a policy on investment in the educational aspect of promoting the open data and its mm. usefulness? Just from you know, what experience and what you hear from uh, various surveys and interviews, um, I think the getting particularly PhD students um, into the habit of looking for data um, at, at established data centers is actually a really important thing because um, you know it's a the process of research is evolving how we do research is quite different now to what it was um, I won't say a long time ago when I did my PhD <laughs> um, it's very different. Um, very different, and 
So I think we need to do, we do need to think about how we encourage students and PhD students, research students in particular, to go down that sort of road, build it into expectations of supervision. And you mentioned that as part of the infrastructure under our definition here is includes hard and soft, and that the education is a really critical aspect of that. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, John and Nicholas, who's not here, thank you. Um, for that. Thank you. Um, as always, if any follow up questions or commentary, please um, contact John directly um, at the Victoria Centre for Strategic Economic, no, Victoria Institute, isn't it, for Strategic Economic Studies, yeah. or me, Greg Lochran, here at ANS. And just uh, noting in the final slide that we are part of this INCRIS initiative in Australia, which is all about this kind of thing. And show where we can find the ones on the website. Get to all of these reports from the quick links on our website. So you've got the cost, the original one that John talked about, the costs and benefits of data provision is there, the equation is there, and some short words talking about it. <laughs> and then from the quick links again, the latest one, the Open Data Report, is available there. So very easy to find from any page on the ANS website. And below the screen, there is that figure again. So thank you, John, Adrian, Nicholas, Susanna, and everyone who logged in today.